Okay, so good afternoon and uh, welcome to this talk on uh, reducing boot time of Linux devices. Uh, I am Chris Simmons and um, let me just quickly go through this. This is just some licensing stuff. A little bit about me. Um, I've been using Linux as an embedded operating system for 20 years now and Android for about 10. Uh, you'll often find me at uh, conferences such as this. Um, and I've written a book, uh, just to uh, show you there. Uh, it's actually quite a good book, just to say. Um <laughs> <coughs> and, and you can contact me by various electronic means. So this is a talk about um, Linux devices, but so I'm meaning Linux running in some kind of uh, uh, equipment where it's the, it's the main application. So I'm talking about uh, things like the weighing scales in the supermarket that weigh your bananas, or the entertainment system in, uh, in, in in-flight in uh, entertainment, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and almost always uh, boot time is an issue. Uh, these are things that are not visibly computers, so you turn it on, you want it to happen straight away, or at least as close as straight away as you can get. Okay, um, so, um, yeah, we can reduce boot time. We are software engineers, so we can always twiddle things, we can always optimize things, there is no, uh, there's no limit to that. So, the real issue is, how much effort do you want to put into this optimization phase, and crucially, how big a mess will you leave when you've finished? So this is coming from the fact that I've worked on a number of uh, uh, projects where a lot of time has been put into optimizing the boot time, but it's left a system that is kind of unmaintainable. So let me just illustrate that. <coughs> so this is a Reliant Robin three-wheeler car. Uh, if you've ever watched Top Gear, I'm sure you will have seen one of these probably being turned over or, s or blown up or something. Um, so it has a problem in, in startup time. Uh, zero to 60 miles per hour, you need a calendar rather than a stopwatch to measure that. Okay, so let's, let's optimize it. So it's been optimized, it can do the, the, the startup much more quickly, but is it really what you want? Is it maintainable? Uh, imagine the support issues from, from a, a vehicle like this. So there is a danger of over-optimizing. So what I'm talking about here then is uh, how to pragmatically uh, improve the, the, uh, the boot time without going to do crazy things. And this is inspired by a talk by a guy called Andrew Murray, who has done a number of uh, similar talks that I've attended. And in one of them, well, I in the first one, he described in extreme detail how you can boot uh, a particular application in less than one second. Uh, and then subsequently, uh, at, a, at a later conference, he uh, explained that uh, whilst that is possible, uh, it turned out n to be not maintainable. The particular customer that that was done for uh, maintained it for one product cycle, and then they found it too hard, and they went back to much longer boot cycles. So I'm emphasizing here things that are fairly easy to do uh, and can be built into the build system so that they will be uh, there for the future. And the guiding principles are uh, measure, evaluate, modify. There's no point optimizing something until you've measured what it is that you're optimizing. The examples I'm going to be showing are based on a, a sample system, which is my uh, favorite little board, the, the BeagleBone Black. Uh, it's a nice little board, fairly slow processor, just a single core. And um, the particular implementation I, I did was based on a Yocto project build. And the application I'm running is a Qt app. Uh, QT4 for no particular good reason other than I couldn't actually get QT5 to build in the time that I had available. Um, oh, and just to make things uh, difficult for myself, I'm using system D as the init daemon rather than plain old uh, system 5. 
Just a little bit about the measuring part of this first then. So you've got to measure first. Uh, I'm going to be talking about three uh, different tools, Grab Serial, Boot Chart, and Boot Graph. They all do, uh, they're, they're all good at different things. So Grab Serial is really good because it simply uh, grabs the serial output to the serial port uh, of your device and add time adds timestamps in. So no modification of software inside the device required. Uh, it gives you a, a broad brush idea of how long it's taken to get to various stages. Uh, boot chart is handy because it gives you a nice graphical view of what happens when you boot a system up. So it's great for uh, looking at the, the, the user space startup, uh, the order in which applications start, and therefore why doesn't your application start sooner. And then uh, Boot Graph is a kernel tool for profiling the kernel boot up time. So I'll look at all three of those uh, in turn. These are all software approaches to measuring, and so since you are measuring software with software, there is some uh, observer effect going on here. You can get more m accurate measurements using a little bit of hardware. So the typical approach here would be to uh, use a GPIO pin and twiddle that pin up and down when you reach certain critical points in the software. And then you use your oscilloscope or logic analyzer, trigger that when you power on, and then you can see exactly how long it takes to the point at which it triggers it, it twiddles the uh, GPIO, and that means you've got to a particular relevant point. I'm not going to describe that any further, but I'm just saying that that, that is uh, an option. Mm. So grab CRO then. First of all, nice little tool, little Python script. Um, you just run it like this. So grab serial, minus D and the serial port on your uh, device on, uh, sorry, on your 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 host system, your laptop or or, p or PC or whatever. Typically, that's going to be a USB port these days, so it'll be TTY USB zero in my case. Uh, minus T because we wanted to print timestamps. That's kind of the whole point of doing this, in actual fact. And then minus M, and you give a string. This is the trigger string, so it's going to start uh, it's going to start uh, timing from the point at which it sees that string. Uh, on the serial port. And then optionally, uh, we can log this to a file with the minus O boot bit, uh, minus O uh, boot log. And if you log into a file like this, you need to tell Grab Serial to close the file at some point, otherwise you're going to lose the last few um, blocks of data. So minus E30 means it's it will close the file after 30 seconds. If you're just dumping stuff for the console, then you can miss off the minus E and the minus O uh, and just see what, uh, what appears on the screen. So running that for my demo system, I see something like this. Uh, so there's the, uh, the trigger, which is the same string as we gave here. Um, so that says that uh, it actually took 398 microseconds to output this string. Actually, I think it's, strictly speaking, from the end of the trigger to the end of the line is 398 microseconds. So this column here, this is the timestamp, and this column here is the delta uh, between this line and the previous line. So we can see it's uh, chugging away doing stuff, and I've lef left a bit out here and then we get to running the application, and that took 11.756 something or other, whoops, microsecond, uh, seconds, actual seconds. So putting that all together, we find that the entire boot is, I've split it into three, fra three phases, uh, the bootloader, uh, then the kernel, and then user space. So putting it all together comes to 11.76-ish seconds. That's quite a long time, considering it's not doing a huge amount. So I'd like to reduce that as much as possible. Uh, my initial aim when, when I was putting this presentation together was to do it in less than two seconds. As you'll see, I didn't quite achieve that, but uh, I got quite close.
Oh, and I'm going to do the optimi optimizations starting from the come back starting from the right hand side. So user space, then kernel, then U boot. And that's kind of the logical way of doing things. It's generally easier to do things in user space and optimizations here, and then skip on to looking at the kernel, and then skip on to U boot. The kind of things that you'd be looking at uh, when optimizing the, the, the user space part of the boot, the main thing really is optimizing the boot script or the boot order itself. Um, you really want to make sure, since this is the most important application that init is going to launch, you want to make sure it does that uh, early on. Other things you could look at doing, uh, and typically do do, um, you can tweak uh, compiler settings, uh, try different optimization levels, see which works best on your particular processor and combination of uh, things. Um, and you can go to extreme lengths to optimize the libraries, you can preload things, you can reorder s library segments, you can do all kinds of crazy things, each of which will save you a little bit of time. Um, but I'm not going to go into that. Before we get to actually doing the optimizations then, we need to measure what it is we're optimizing. And for this we're going to be using boot chart. So boot chart is a really nice general purpose uh, logging tool. <laughs> um, yeah, Bootchart is a really nice uh, general purpose login tool, a lot of stuff about it here. Um, if you're using Yocto, uh, it's uh, part of, uh, there are packages in Yocto uh, and open embedded for that, and there's even a little cut down version of this in BusyBox. Uh, essentially, the idea then is that you run the Bootchart tool instead of init. So you change the uh, kernel command line to look some something like this. So that runs the boot chart daemon. Uh, and then once it's started the daemon running, it then forks, uh, sorry, it then executes a copy of init. So then it boots up as, as normal. So then boot chart daemon is going to capture the data and it will end up writing it to this file here. By default, you can change that if you wish, but that's where it will end up typically. And then, oops. Uh, and then you run uh, the boot chart application, which will analyze that, uh, that boot chart TG TGZ file and give you a nice graph as shown briefly on the next slide. Uh, I just want to say you are not expected to read what's on the slide because it's way too detailed. But I just like the picture. It's really nice. So this is the kind of thing you get out of boot chart. Um, if you put on your opera glasses, you can just about see here, this is the uh, Qt demo program. So this is the thing that we actually are trying to run. And again, if you use a little bit of imagination, uh, that comes out at somewhere around about eight seconds on that timeline at the top there. Okay, and oh, the other interesting thing here is um, in this part here, this is showing you the CPU usage as it goes through the boot process. And really you're looking for a solid blue bar here because that indicates that the CPU is 100% busy because if it's 100% busy, it's doing 100% of the work. And indeed it, it is. So it says here, careful analysis of the boot chart shows that Qt demo is not started until 3.5 seconds after init begins. That's actually a bit of a lie. Let me just say something. A careful analysis of the, ch of the chart actually shows it starts at about eight seconds. But what I haven't said on the slide is that boot chart actually starts measuring here from the point at which the kernel starts running. So we need to subtract 4.53 seconds from the eight point whatever it was, and that does come out to be 3.7-ish seconds. In other words, this, sec this, this part from here to here is the kernel booting. Uh, this is where system D starts up. Well, mm, the numbers are slightly off, but believe me, that, that's, that's, that's the true start. 
And so this is three point whatever it was seconds in. So we need to move it up the batting order. I apologize for this. This is a, a, an English um, sporting metaphor uh, relating to cricket. Uh, I'm assuming not many people here play cricket, so that probably doesn't really work. Never mind. You can imagine what it means. Um, so we need to make it to happen uh, sooner. And this isn't too difficult to do. You just need to change the way that your init daemon works. So if you're using system 5 init, um, system 5 init starts things in the order of the S scripts. So uh, S01 would be the first thing that started, and S99 would be the last thing. So just move it up to a higher number, for example, S01 will get you there. If you're using system D, you can do something somewhat similar. You need to change the dependency in the service unit for the thing that starts your service. And I've got an example of how to do that at the end of the slides, which we may or may not get onto, depending on how much uh, time we have spare. So you can do either of those things. In fact, what I actually did do um, in the example is I cheated completely and I actually changed it to run my program first and then init second. So the Qt demo starts up and then I start init. That guarantees I get uh, the first byte of the cookie. There are downsides in doing this. If the earlier you are in the init, a sequence, the less of the system that is actually working. So if you do as I've done here and you start up before and it runs, it means that probably that your root file system is going to read be read-only at this point. Uh, there may not, uh, the, the dev directory may not have been populated yet, uh, and various other things may not have worked yet. So it depends how much of the system you expect to be working at the point at which your application starts. If you simply want to display something on the screen and be able to uh, start accepting some kind of input, then this works fine. So the way to do that is with a little shell script like this. So uh, I called it run Qt demo. And so this is run in place of init. So we put init equals run Qt demo on the kernel command line, runs this script. This is script that is being run uh, instead of init, so this is PID1. This line here is going to run a copy of my program, Qt demo. Uh, the ampersand means it will fork uh, a, new, uh, a new process, so that will run with a different PID. Okay? And then I exec init. So that means that I now run init still as PID1. And it turns out that it's important, actually, that init runs with PID1. Various things will go wrong if init isn't PID1. This little bit here is um, a bit of a hack. Uh, but if you uh, run init immediately after running your, your application, then init comes along and it starts stealing CPU cycles from you. So this little sleep here is to give this a head start so that it gets, uh, well it gets this initialization done before we run the init program. Okay, so this, this number here is somewhat empirical. You'll have to uh, tweak that somewhat. Okay, so that guarantees that we get started early on and good news is we've saved three and a half seconds off the boot time because now the user space boot up is almost nothing. So that's nice. So that's good. So we're down to uh, just a little over eight seconds. So we're getting there. You can kind of see, by the way, that, of course, you know, there's no magic bullet to do this. It is a question when you're optimizing boot time to look at each element uh, and optimize each one individually. Uh, the next thing then is the kernel. So what kind of thing could we expect to do here? 
Um, okay, well, th there's one very simple thing to do, actually. This is this quiet thing. This is a, a handy little, little um, easy win. Most embedded devices have a serial port for the console. So all the stuff that Linux prints out as it boots up goes to a serial console, typically running at 115, uh, 200 board. That's quite slow. So just outputting all that stuff slows things down quite a lot. You can simply add quiet to the kernel command line to vastly reduce the amount of stuff that it prints out. And that can be a big win. Other things you can do, um, typically wi by the time you got to this point here, if you're just using the, uh, the kernel configuration that, was that you had with your dev board uh, or whate wherever you got it from, probably there is more functionality enabled uh, in the kernel than you really need. And each one of those uh, device drivers takes time to, uh, to initialize. Plus, it takes time to actually load the kernel into memory uh, and decompress it. So it's worthwhile optimizing the kernel configuration and uh, chopping out stuff that you don't need. You can do something similar by, instead of hacking at the kernel, you can hack at the device tree. And you can just go through the device tree and just prune out any branches that uh, don't do anything useful. But of course, Doing it through the device tree doesn't reduce the size of the kernel, so you still you, you, you're gaining by not uh, initializing so quite so many device drivers, but you don't get the gain of reducing the size of the load uh, into memory in the first place. Another thing you can do that's uh, it says tricky here; it's not hugely tricky, but um, some uh, device drivers have well, all device drivers have a probe function which is called by the kernel to interrogate the hardware and see what's there. And sometimes there are timeouts involved in checking if a piece of hardware is there. Um, quite often you can go through and optimize uh, these things out. Uh, but this is modifying the kernel code, so it's not so maintainable, and it requires a, a degree of skill of knowing which bits to, uh, to optimize. Again, before we start hacking around, we need to do uh, some measurements. So for this, I'm going to introduce you to Boot Graph. Uh, so Boot Graph is a kernel uh, feature. You turn it on just by, uh, you need to turn on these two things, config print k time, config k all sims in your kernel configuration, if they're not already. And you need to boot up with in it called debug on the kernel command line. So that will, somebody get a phone call? That will, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. That, that will instrument the, uh, the output uh, to, the, uh, to the console. And then you can take a copy of that. So dmessage uh, redirect to boot.log. Uh, copy that back to your uh, development PC, and you then run this script, uh, which will take your boot log file and generate an SVG file, and then you can, den uh, you can display the SVG file. And you'll see something like this. So this is the actual one I got for the uh, BeagleBone. This, by the way, is not the entire file. It goes on beyond there, but I, I truncated it at this point. But one big thing jumps out at you, which is this big bluish color bar here, which is taking almost two seconds. So what is that? So I rotated my head through 90 degrees and got a microscope and read that text there. And it says, RAID 6 select algo. Um, WTF. What's that doing there? This is the RAID device. So I did a bit of grepping, a bit of Googling, and a bit of scratching of the head. And I eventually discovered that um, RAID, 6, RAID 6 select algo is uh, there because of a configuration option, BTRFS, butterfs, fs. Um, 
And ButterFS was only enabled because this was a generic kernel, so it's just one of the many file systems I could possibly have used on my BeagleBone Black. Well, I'm not using it, and so I don't need to spend two seconds for it not to do anything. So this is easy. We just scrape out ButterFS and throw the toast on the floor. Uh, so I did that. So that's the big win. That saves me 108, uh, so 1.8 seconds. Uh, I also added quiet to the command line. That saved me 700 milliseconds. And then I spent a happy hour or so hacking away at the kernel configuration. And I managed to slim it down from 5.6 megabytes to 3.2. And I saved myself 450 milliseconds. Cool. So altogether, add those together, numbers together, I hope that comes to, actually it doesn't, but never mind, <laughs> it comes to just over three seconds. Uh, hello, there's a, there's a slide missing there, never mind. So that's good, so we, we're getting there. So that leaves one more area to look at, which is the bootloader. Uh, the bootloader we're using here is U-Boot. So most embedded devices use U-Boot, or at least ARM, most ARM-based embedded devices use U-Boot. So kind of things you can do with U-Boot, uh, there's one rather trivial thing you can do. Uh, the default configuration of most U-Boot uh, installations actually has a delay for a number of seconds. And during that delay, you can press a, usually the space bar and it gives you a U-boot uh, command prompt, and then you can do an interactive session with U-boot. Obviously, we don't need that on a production system. Um, also, U-boot has its own command language, and the default uh, configuration of U-boot typically will try lots of different ways of loading a kernel and a device tree and a RAM disk. So we could look at optimizing that uh, sequence. And then if you want to go a step further, there is a thing called Falcon mode, which I won't describe further here. But again, at the end of the slides, there is a description of Falcon mode. And um, I give you the commands to, d to run U-boot in Falcon mode on the BeagleBone. Uh, and that would in itself save, mm, we're talking hundreds of milliseconds. We're not talking seconds here, but it does make a saving. So first one then. This one's really, really easy. We need to uh, disable the boot delay. So this is what you see on the screen. Press space to abort order boot in two seconds. You then have two seconds to hit the space bar. If you do that, you go into interactive mode and you can talk to U-Boot. Otherwise, it goes into auto-boot mode and loads the kernel. Um, we can just type set end boot delay zero and save end. And that sets it to zero seconds, so we won't see this. As a matter of interest, uh, you can still hit the space bar if you're quick enough. So as long as you can hit the space bar within zero seconds, you can still get a command prompt. Actually, it's a, sli a slight cheat. Actually, if you press the space bar after U-Boot has initialized, but before it reads the, uh, the input, the space bar character will be in the input buffer, and it will read it. So you actually are doing it before zero. Anyhow, so this is nice, low-hanging fruit, fruit. That saves us two seconds without too much effort. The other thing that I looked at is the uh, set of boot scripts, particularly for the BeagleBone Black, which are quite complex because there are a lot of different configurations depending which capes you've got plugged in and whether you're booting from uh, SSD or EMM, uh, EMMC or whatever. Um, so the default uh, U-boot scripts look like this. Well, th this is the first 21 lines. Uh, I omitted the remaining 100 lines. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on here. Each one of these is going to take some time to execute. Even if it's a small amount of time, it still is some time. 
So I decided that um, I would just blow all this lot away because it doesn't do anything that I really need. And I replaced 100, 122 lines of code with four lines. Um, because this is all I need to load and run the BeagleBone in the particular environment that I want. So that saved me uh, two seconds from getting rid of the boot delay, 230 milliseconds from optimizing the boot scripts. So this is my final uh, uh, um, um, measurement. So now we have a uh, little over a second, uh, sorry, a little under a second in the bootloader, one and a half seconds loading the kernel, and then almost no time loading user space. So put it all together, that comes to 2.61 seconds, which isn't quite my two second uh, target, but it's, it's close enough for the, for the purposes of this talk. So if I wanted to go further, I would, I would obviously need to look further at optimizing the kernel. One and a half seconds to boot a kernel is quite a long time. I would ha have to start hacking out some more stuff, I think. And by switching to using Falcon mode for the U for U boot, I could probably get down that down to 500 milliseconds. So it illustrates, however, that you have this this law of diminishing returns. That once you got to this point here, you you've done all the simple things. It gets harder and harder and harder to uh, make it go uh, still faster. How are we doing? Okay, um, yeah, so that's, that's the main part of it then. So conclusion, uh, boot time reduction is one of these things that gets incrementally more difficult uh, the, the more time you want to optimize. But the simple things I've gone through, um, possibly with exception of the Falcon mode thing, they're eminently scriptable and uh, they don't impact uh, the, the maintain maintenance going forwards. Uh, of your system. The more, of course, you hack around at, uh, at, at the code level, the more maintenance problems you're going to have, so we're trying to avoid that. Um, oh, and look to the future. The, uh, the point I want to make there is that once you've done this, so wha what typically happens is that um, Somewhere late in the product development, somebody realizes that boot time is an issue, so we go through all this stuff and we optimize it. Uh, and then once the optimization has been done, typically the team that did that sort of disappears off into something else. And then you get into the bit rot uh, phase where people make uh, changes here and there, uh, people add on functions, uh, new features and whatever, each one of which increases the boot time again. So this isn't a one shot. You have to do this on a regular uh, uh, basis in order to make sure that you don't slip back uh, to where you were. Okay, so it's on. It's an ongoing process, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so that's the main bit. Are there, I've got a few more slides after this, which I'll briefly go through, and then we'll do the Q and A bit. Uh, but let me just say then that the slides are available on SlideShare. Uh, and I'll, I'll tweet that URL uh, shortly. And the remainder of this slide is, uh, is a blatant plug, uh, I've got to say. Um, but this is um, basically part of what I do uh, for my day job. I run training classes in embedded Linux, and this and many other things are covered in my training classes. Thank you. So, <laughs> no, 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 no. wait, 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 wait. We, have, we haven't got, we got to the end yet. Um, yeah, so I always have a few slides at the end of my presentation just to uh, uh, allow for the fact. And these, are, these are quite long time slots at this, uh, this show. So uh, I've kind of met my 40 minute uh, time slot, but I've actually got a few more minutes to go. So let me just briefly go through some of the extra slides at the end. I won't go through every single one, but let's just do the interesting bits and then we'll do the Q&A. So, um, Oh yeah, this, this is a bit about systemd. I don't know how familiar you guys are with systemd. This is a systemd uh, service unit for my Qt demo, blah, blah, blah. And 
the important thing here is the wanted by bit. So this is um, wanted by multi-user target. So when, when we hit multi-user target, then it will run this unit. Multi-user target is the last target that system D uh, executes during the boot up. If we want to move it up the batting order, as I call it, then you could do something like this. Um, and all I've done really is I've just uh, selected uh, sysinit as the target. So sysinit is one of the first targets that uh, system D uh, gets to. So you could try sysinit. Be aware though that it is really early in the sequence, so you still are going to be initialized ahead of, say, the network. So at this point, the network will not be up and running. Uh, your root file system is probably still read-only, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you don't like sysinit, there's also another target called basic target. So basic target is somewhere between sysinit uh, target and uh, multi-user target. So you can experiment with uh, each one of those three and see what which one works best for you. Or you can just say, mm, we don't need, we don't need uh, init at all, and we'll do it uh, using the little hack I showed uh, earlier on in the presentation. And I just want to do the first couple of slides about uh, U-Boot Falcon mode. Um, this is kind of low level. The idea is that the way a typical uh, embedded SOC boots is in several phases. So specifically three, three phases. So the first phase is uh, the ROM code phase. So the ROM code is code built into the chip itself. It's mask programmed when the chip was manufactured. Um, and it's a simple bit of code. Generally speaking, it's just going to load some uh, uh, the, the, the next stage of bootloader into some static memory. It has to be static memory because at this point the dynamic RAM controller hasn't been initialized. So we don't have any, any main RAM. We only have the static RAM that's on chip. Problem is that static RAM is quite expensive and most chips only have a few hundred kilobytes of static RAM. So what we call next the SPL, the second stage program loader, uh, has to fit into that SRAM. In the case of the BeagleBone, the, the we have 120 k bytes uh, free. 120 k bytes is not enough for U-boot for the bootloader, so we load uh, the SPL, second stage uh, program loader, into SRAM. That has enough functionality, however, to initialize the DRAM the main memory. So at this point, w once this is run, we now have uh, f uh, half a gigabyte of memory to play with. So then the SPL loads uh, the main bootloader into DRAM, and then U-boot, the main bootloader, loads the kernel and the device tree and the RAM disk and whatever else, and then sets it all running. So that's the normal boot uh, sequence, not only for the BeagleBone, but for pretty much every uh, embedded processor that there is. The idea then of Falcon mode is basically to merge uh, steps two and three together. In other words, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually create a shrunk version of U-Boot that fits in the SRAM? Which means in the case of the uh, chip on the BeagleBone, it has to fit in 120K. So you can do this just about, but um, you lose quite a lot of things, so you lose the command shell, so you can't do any user interaction with it. Uh, you lose uh, the scripting capabilities, a whole bunch of other things. So you have to basically hard code uh, the Falcon mode to do exactly what you want. And if you want to change anything, you will have to go back and recode it all. And then the remainder, oh, this is all documented in the U-Boot source code in the readme.falcon file if you want to delve into more details of this. Um, and the remainder of the slides, which I'm not going to go through, uh, describe how to do this for the AM335X chip that's on the BeagleBone. And there are similar procedures for IMX uh, chips and I think for some of the Qualcomm MSM chips and so on and so on and so on. But I'll leave you to research that at your leisure. Um, I think...
think that's, yeah, that's all I really want to do. So I'm going to come back to this slide here. Yeah. So that's the end of the presentation. So it's time to uh, open up you to you guys for some Q&A. Uh, so does anybody have any questions? It's always the guy at the back, isn't it? It's always the guy at the back who asks the questions. I, I'm just thinking of, of the poor, uh, the, the microphone man. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so your method with having like a shell script that starts your Qt application first, one disadvantage I see is that systemd will no longer supervise that process. Have you researched into a way to make systemd retroactively aware of that process with some clever hack or something? Um, I think the simple answer to that is no. Uh, I haven't researched that. Okay. Um, anybody have any uh, system defu in the audience who would know how to do that? I suspect it's not possible then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no I um, my assumption is that once it's running, it's running, and it's like you say, it's outside of, of system D's yeah, knowledge. Yeah. This is something which system D doesn't know about. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so that's both a good thing and a bad thing. I'm assuming that it's not an issue. Anyone else? Why are, are you doing that? Can I just ask how many people here are embedded developers? Just before you ask the question. Oh my God, almost everybody. Whoa, cool. Well, I suppose you wouldn't be here if you weren't. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, <coughs> I just wanted to know if you looked into, because the boot timings now are measured up until you start the application, right? Did you, l do you have any nice uh, tricks to actually optimize this the start, like statically linking a minimal version of Qt into your example app? Because I guess if you load too, too much things dynamically, it would also add time until the application is actually showing something on the screen or what your application is doing. Yeah, you're, you're quite right. So largely because uh, it's, I didn't have a way of measuring the point at which the application appears on the screen. I would need some kind of camera and some kind of thing to recognize that it's done that. And I, or I could just put, a, uh, I suppose, a print statement in, in the application, but I didn't actually do that. So I'm kind of missing out a little bit uh, the actual length of time from the application starting, in other words, the point at which we exec uh, Qt demo to the point it would actually appears on the screen. Um, there are, as you indicate, a lot of uh, interesting hacks you can perform to improve that. Uh, I'm not sure the static linking would really help in this case uh, because the, the dynamic linker is fairly efficient. Uh, but you could carefully arrange things so that you don't bring in all the functionality. In other words, don't, call ma don't make all the library calls at once and therefore load all the libraries into memory at once. Uh, but if you carefully sequence things, so you have a module which is going to display the initial screen and then another separate uh, module which calls another library and so on and so on. Uh, and you can also do some clever things with library linking scripts, but that gets to be somewhat painful. So, yeah, th there are things you can do which I, uh, I haven't got details of. Uh, actually, if you really want to go into that, if you look at the uh, presentation from Andrew Murray, who I referenced earlier on, he does uh, go into great detail on how to create an optimized set of Qt libraries. Uh, so I'd recommend go back to his presentation from about 2001, 2002, uh, sorry, 2011 or 2012. Uh, he's got a lot of detail on that. When are you planning to have a speech about reducing the boot time of Android devices <laughs> in, <laughs> in a Google <laughs> compliant and CTS compliant way? Uh, so yes, doing the same thing for Android um, is an interesting challenge and a relevant challenge as well as Android becomes uh, used more and more in, in automotive. Uh, applications and typically in automotive applications there is uh, a legal requirement that the system becomes active within two seconds of turning on the ignition key or something along those lines. 
uh, specifically for the rear view camera. If you, if you start reversing, you want to see people before you run them over, ideally. So to answer the question then, can you optimize uh, Android boot time? And the answer is yes, a bit. Um, but I mean, you can basically optimize the bits I've kind of mentioned on the, on the presentation applied to, uh, to Android. But you're left with a big chunk of initialization, which is starting up the Android framework, uh, which is done by a Java program called uh, System Server. And it's kind of huge. And it's kind of coded sequentially. There's no parallelization in there. And short of completely rewriting it, and given that it's, I don't know, a million lines of code or something, there isn't really much you can do about it. So my advice uh, to optimizing uh, Android boot time is don't even try. <laughs> um, it, it's basically not possible to get it below about 20 seconds. So hey, guys, you've got to live with it. Which uh, brings me then on to the thing I just mentioned, that how come uh, we're using or certain companies in this vicinity are about to use Android in the head unit of their, of their vehicles. How do you get around the regulation of needing to display the, uh, the rear view camera within two seconds? So Android has a way of doing this called the EVS, the exterior view system. Ah, you've heard of it. So uh, the EVS is a, uh, two components, it's a camera uh, uh, device and a display device and a little application that joins them together. All written in uh, C++, so no Java. Uh, no dependencies on the framework. So what actually happens is that the EVS system gets started up before the framework gets started. And so if you do the things I mentioned on the slide here, you can do that within two seconds. So within two seconds then you'll have the camera streaming video to uh, the display completely bypassing Android. That's the way to do it. Uh, and that's the Google way to do it, I've got to say. OK, any other questions? Hi, do you have any um, tips on catching stuff early on in the boot, boot process? very early on, on the few first few mi uh, milliseconds, like uh, stuff happens uh, with loading and uh, internal boat loaders into the microcontroller and uh, we catch early output from the UART that, we that you it's pretty hard to catch sometimes. Yeah, so my approach is using Grab Serial, which requires the UART to be operational and for something to be outputting text to the to the to the serial port. If you want to capture things before that point, then really you're down to using uh, logic analyzers. That's the only way you're going to do it. So you need a logic analyzer, trigger it when the reset button is pressed on the processor and then stop it when a GPIO, so you have to go and modify some code somewhere to twiddle some GPIOs. Uh, and then you, know, you, you could then measure that length of time and then optimize it in some way. Y th this is assuming, of course, that you have the source code and that you can modify uh, the boot process at this point. Quite often at this point, actually, you are running proprietary binary blobs which you have no control over. Mm. Um, you can get some way actually just by monitoring the uh, the current load, by just by me measuring the, the power uh, consumed, and you will then see that you know the, the power starts at zero, and then when you hit the power button, it's going to ramp up as it goes through various loading processes. So you can sometimes relate that power uh, graph back to particular modules being loaded, and then you can go back to your SOC vendor and say, uh, we think that the, uh, the trust zone uh, is taking a long time to initialize, or we think that the power manager is, is uh, taking a long time to start up for some reason. But as I say, usually at that point, you don't actually have control of the source code. And so whatever you discover at that point, 
you are going to have to go back to the vendor in order to get any changes made. Uh, oh, it was, well the comment is, yeah, we could always maybe choose a different microprocessor. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, ideally, I mean, th th choosing a different microprocessor is a great thing to do because it teaches the other guy uh, not to do whatever it is they're doing wrong. Unfortunately, usually you don't discover this point until you, you have committed, or at least your, your hardware engineers have committed to using that particular SOC. And they may even have bought uh, a few hundred thousand of them. So it's usually too late to change manufacturer at that point, which is a pity. But yeah, current measuring is a good, th good deal. Okay, we've got, yeah, we've got a few minutes. Well, we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, Thanks for a great speech. Uh, I have a question. You have tri uh, tried GTAG together with the, the Linux system? Have we tried which? Using GTAG. JTAG. Oh, JTAG, sorry. <laughs> uh, or ETAG. Um, um, uh, actually, I haven't for a long time used uh, JTAG, but would that help you? I guess you can help that. That would help you by being able to set uh, breakpoints on certain memory addresses which you know are being used. So I guess a, a JTAG or some other uh, in-circuit uh, debug probe would, would help you on that. Uh, I, I don't have any personal experience of that, not in the last 15 years at least, that would be useful. Has anyone else in here done it? Any JTAG hackers here? Okay, nice. You can talk later then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I think we probably need to wrap it up at this point. Uh, so thank you all very much for, uh, um, for, for listening patiently to me. And um, if you want to uh, talk to me, I'll be hanging around in the foyer for the next, uh, uh, next presentation. So thank you all very much. Now <laughs>